called malachite. Now malachite does contain copper, but not as the metal. The copper in the ore is combined with other things. However, malachite can be changed into copper metal. What's needed to make this happen is fire, but the right kind of fire, one that will provide not only a source of heat, but also a source of partially burnt wood, charcoal. Charcoal is mainly carbon. The malachite and the right kind of fire probably came together by accident. You see, malachite was collected for jewellery because of its attractive appearance, and it could quite easily have fallen into a place where fires were built. We asked the people at the Butzer ancient farm to reconstruct this accident for us. The fire in which the accident most likely occurred was one used for baking clay pots. It's known that clay pots were commonly baked in fires like this. What we didn't know was what happens to malachite in this kind of fire. The fire is rather unusual because it's deliberately covered in a layer of soil. That greatly cuts down the amount of air that can get in. Twenty-four hours later, and the pots are well baked, just as expected. But that's not all. The fire produced large quantities of carbon in the form of charcoal, and that, together with the heat, changed the malachite. The result? Copper metal. The reaction is called smelting. Happy accidents like this eventually led to deliberate attempts to produce copper from malachite, and on a much larger scale. Again, the people at the Butzer ancient farm showed us how that might have been done. It's thought that the copper was produced by adding the copper ore to a charcoal fire in a specially made furnace. Bellows were used to send a blast of air through the fire. As the malachite gets hot, it begins to change. It's only at the start that air is blown through the fire. That's to raise the temperature of the burning charcoal to about a thousand degrees centigrade. But the charcoal isn't only there as a fuel. Charcoal, which is mostly carbon, has another vital role to play. The carbon combines with other things in the malachite, slowly changing it. The fire was left for 24 hours to allow time for the reaction to take place and hopefully to produce copper metal. It seems the experiment had worked, but we had hoped for rather more than this. So we dug deeper into the bottom of the furnace. Where we found a large lump of stuff that had melted and hardened again. There was certainly some metal there, but how much? great surprise, it was nearly all copper. We had smelted a large quantity of copper from malachite. Copper, from which tools can be made. The development of smelting thousands of years ago meant that enough copper became available for a whole range of tools, particularly cutting tools. But although these copper axes do have hard, sharp edges, they're still not as hard as flint. 
an improvement came about when the copper was combined with the next metal to be smelted, tin. At first, it was probably only a sense of experiment that led the early metal workers to add a small amount of tin to their copper and remelt them on the fire. Today we call this mixture of copper and tin bronze, and bronze was the next step forward. Okay, stop playing. A small quantity of tin in the mixture alters the properties of the copper. When bronze is cast, it solidifies into a material that is very much harder than copper. The dents on the underside of the axe were caused by bubbles of gas trapped during the casting. Nevertheless, it still makes a very good axe. Bronze cutting tools, particularly axes, really were a big improvement over flint. Now, once the new technique of smelting had been developed, it was only natural for people to try to obtain other metals from other raw materials they found around them. One such metal was iron. But they found they needed a better furnace. The design of this one is such that the charcoal burns at about 1200 degrees centigrade, the temperature needed to smelt iron ore to give iron. The trouble is that the kind of iron produced, cast iron, is not particularly useful. It breaks easily, it's brittle. Yet the sense of experiment continued, and it was soon realized that the properties of the cast iron could be altered. Again, heat and carbon played a vital role. Repeated heating and hammering changes the way cast iron behaves. It's hard work, but the results are worth it. A type of iron that can be bent without breaking. It's called wrought iron. Obviously, a material that can be bent and beaten into a whole range of shapes is a great improvement over a brittle material. But wrought iron cannot be used very successfully for cutting tools. It's too soft. There are ways of hardening it up. By heating wrought iron in a charcoal fire, the metal picks up carbon, which then can be beaten in. If this is now heated and cooled rapidly, the result is a much harder iron, an early form of steel. An excellent material for a whole range of tools and implements which needed sharp edges or points. In fact, the demand for hard, high-quality tools and implements became so great that by the 14th century, cast iron was being produced in blast furnaces. Still fueled by charcoal, but on a much larger scale. A blast furnace like this could produce over a tonne of iron per week. And on this scale, the bellows providing the blast of air were powered by water. In fact, water power was not only used to drive the bellows, it was also used to drive the hammers which beat out the wrought iron and beat in the carbon to produce the steel, now wanted in ever-increasing quantities. In this country alone, steel production was up to 60,000 tonnes per year by 1850, and the level jumped to 210,000 tonnes per year by 1870. But even that was almost nothing compared with what was to come. Five million tons in 1900, 
13 million tonnes in 1940 and a massive 29 million tonnes in 1970. Today, iron and steel making remains one of our major industries. Obviously, an operation of this size couldn't be fueled by charcoal. There just aren't enough trees. Instead, coal has been the fuel for blast furnaces for the last 250 years, because there's lots of it. Coal, too, is mostly carbon. So not only is it a fuel, it also takes part in the reaction which changes the iron ore into iron. Unfortunately, the use of coal produces an iron containing too much carbon, which would make the iron brittle again. So modern steel making is concerned with the removal of most of this carbon. That's done by blowing oxygen over the molten iron. The flow of oxygen is carefully controlled to leave in just a small amount of carbon, giving steel again. Today, iron and steel play a vital part in our everyday lives because they can be given just the right properties for a wide variety of uses. But it would be wrong to assume that all their properties are useful. As every car owner knows, today's row of bright, shiny cars can very quickly become tomorrow's pile of scrap. The chief enemy is rust. Unprotected from air and water, iron and steel soon revert back to something very much like iron ore, with disastrous consequences for the structure. The short-term answer for iron and steel is to protect them with a coat of paint. But there is a metal that doesn't rust. These pots and pans won't rust because instead of being made of iron and steel, they're made of aluminium. As is this foil. You may be surprised by just how many things are aluminium. Even the body of this London transport tube train is made from aluminium. The fact that aluminium doesn't rust is a big advantage here because there's no need to paint the trains to protect them, and that saves money. In fact, aluminium is such a useful material for all sorts of things that today it too is produced on a massive scale. This one room contains a thousand furnaces, each one capable of producing a ton of aluminium a day. The raw material, the aluminium ore, pours in by the lorry load. The lid of the furnace is closed and the heating begins. But to smelt aluminium ore, things are very different. It needs electricity. Electricity flowing through the molten raw materials. so much electricity that the factory needs its own power station. Aluminium can be smelted in these quantities because electricity is available on a large scale. But these vast quantities of electricity mean aluminium is very expensive. So why make it at all? Well, compared to iron and steel, aluminium is light. The aluminium bodies on these vans mean less dead weight to carry around. But the most important use made of aluminium's lightness is in building aeroplanes. By far the greatest proportion of this plane is aluminium. Not just the engine housings, but also the wings and the body. Indeed, if this plane was built of iron and steel, it wouldn't even be able to get off the ground. So despite the cost of its smelting, aluminium has now become one of the most important metals in today's technological age. <laughs>